All You're right. ready to go. Okay, we'll just begin with prayer this evening, all right? Our Father and our gracious God, as we consider the subject of revival tonight and spiritual awakening, we pray, Father, that your blessing might be upon this lecture, discussion. We pray that we might be challenged to pray for you to look upon our nation and our society one more time and upon our churches that we might experience what former generations have, a true time of revival and awakening. Bless, we ask, glorify yourself, through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. My subject this evening is just some observations on revival and spiritual awakening. Our nation is headed toward being a socialistic state. And we don't know how far this is going to go. They could put our churches out of business tomorrow by revoking our tax-exempt status, which is simply a gift of the government. And Christianity will not fit in a socialistic state, not true Christianity. And uh, every morning my wife and I pray, we pray for revival and spiritual awakening for our nation. Then we pray for our church, our families, and, uh, and so forth. And it's, uh, to us, it's a matter of the utmost importance. I had dinner at uh, a restaurant in Salinas, California, a few weeks ago with several pastors. They're friends of mine. And some of them are very strongly dispensational. Some are not. And uh, we began to discuss the subject of revival and spiritual awakening. And one of them told me, there's never going to be another revival. He said, we don't pray for revival in our church. We, the days of revival are over. No revival, no spiritual awakening. We're in the time of the great apostasy, just before the coming of the Lord. And so there's no sense in praying for it. And I'm praying for it anyway. I have the view of my all-millennial friend who said to me the other day on the phone, he said, I'm an all-millennialist, but he says, I sure hope the pre-tribulationists, pre-millennialists are right. I want the Lord to come back. Of course, we're both in ill health, and he is, uh, he's pretty crippled, and uh, yes, we desire that. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But there are many that are opposed to this, and there are many good books written on revival, I have, I think it's about 11 or 12 page paper over there, an annotated uh, list of uh, books on revival and spiritual awakening. And there's probably quite a few books there. I've read every book in that list of 11 pages long. And there's probably some books there that you've never heard of. The one I would like to re recommend as a beginning book is by... Uh, Richard Cole Sr. entitled The Mighty Acts of God in America. And I'm going to use his outline as I speak this evening. I would like to look at some passages of scripture that have historically been used for revival. And the first is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Now many people know verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, so on and so forth. But the real issue is the verse before it. And in this day of COVID and other things, we should memorize both verses. And I'll read them for you. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locust to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people and certainly COVID is a pestilence. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal 
their land. Not just praying, but turning from our wicked ways and seeking God's face. In other words, fervent prayer, doing everything we can with our whole life turned to God, praying and seeking God's face for revival and spiritual awakening. I will heal their land. Have any of you seen the, uh, in, in my day, it was a set of, uh, of uh, CDs by W. Kenneth Conley, Lord, Heal Our Land, about the great revivals in Scotland. And it begins with uh, one of the present-day Scottish preachers preaching to close to 500,000 people. They were, as far as you could see, the streets were full of people crowded in uh, to hear uh, the message of the gospel. So think about this. I will heal their land. Psalm 102, verse 13. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. If you've read some of the historical works on revival, that verse was often quoted by the people when they were experiencing times of revival. Here in our country, in the 1700s, in the early 1800s, the set time to favor Zion has come. They'd been praying for revival, and now revival was taking place. And then Isaiah chapter 44, verses 3 and 4. How many of you knew or knew of L.R. Shelton, Jr.? He started Mount Zion publications, and uh, he and I were good friends. And every prayer, every time we prayed together, he would pray this passage of Scripture. He was obsessed with the idea of revival. And his son told me that he experienced a time of revival when they opened Mount Zion Ministries in Florida. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. He said every day from their small printing concern, they would put out one pallet and have it picked up by the post office. And it went all over the world. I began to receive a request for cassette tapes in those days from Africa, all over Africa. And I thought this could not be from family radio because I'd been off family radio for several years. And so I called Brother Shelton on the phone and I said, I'm having requests that we can't fill. And could you fill them? He said, about 10 years ago, we got a whole pile of tape players. And we had 20 of your messages and we sent them out to villages all across Africa. He said, they're just now bearing fruit. A whole village would gather and listen to one of these sermons. I never knew. We would have been praying for this. I never knew until that phone call. And then Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. He said, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans and bring them in to judge my people. They're going to be fierce. They're going to devastate the land. And he was left to pray for what? For revival. I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. He had no promise of deliverance. All he had was a word of judgment from God. And then Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 Peter is preaching on Solomon's porch. Thousands of men who had come there for the hour of prayer. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing, not chronos time, 
but the other word in Greek, which escapes me at this point, meaning a set time, a seasonable time. When the seasonable or set times of refreshing, that means reviving, shall come from the presence of the Lord. And this verse has been used throughout history by men who were praying for revival. And they anticipated revival and times of revival. Now I want to deal with several terms. These are from my book. Uh, one of the books that I wrote is on the history of revivals. It's not the book I wanted to write, but uh, it deals with revival and revivalism and the difference between the two. And I, I have, I suppose, enough material for three or four more books on revival. Maybe I'll go in that direction to set the record straight because of the charismatic push for revival now, having rock concerts and jumping up and down and waving their arms and saying, we are seeing revival begin to spread across this country. And they, they take this to be a real moving of the Spirit of God. But first is reformation. What is a reformation? It's a correction, a removing of faults and defects. Individual Christians and churches should be in a constant state of reformation or conformity and alignment to the scriptures. Every revival brings reformation. And many times, times of reformation bring revival. And then the term revival itself. It comes from the Latin to the French, revivere, to come back to a vigorous state after a decline. It means a revitalization of biblical spirituality after a decline. Revival has to do with churches, with the people of God, who come back to a state of obedience, conformity, of prayer, and seeking the face of God after a time of spiritual decline, a time of revival. Now, a revival may be personal revival. It may be the revival of a congregation. It may be a collective revival in a geographical area, or it may be a worldwide revival. And this term revival includes spiritual awakening or the work that goes forth to the conversion of the unsaved. Dr. Conley, who was mightily used of God in the Fisher Folk Revival of England and Northern Scotland in the 1920s, he was converted at the beginning of that revival. He and Jacques Troup were the major evangelists in that revival. And he said, remember, brethren, revival comes from the skies. Can't be worked up, must come from the skies. And he himself, the, uh, the book, Mended Crockery, that I gave to, uh, that I promised for a year now. Uh, what's your name? Waldrip. To Brother Waldrip. I just gave it to him when we began this meeting. It had a picture of Peter Conley as the head of the Cage Hill Gang, a gangster. And you turn the page, and here he is a month later, Clean shaven, cigarette gone, the hat with the ray, straight razor in it gone, and an open Bible, and he's preaching the gospel. That's the work of God in revival. Sorry about that. I'm not good for names this week. Your smiling face, I remember. The name I forgot. And then a spiritual awakening. Revival results usually on the conversion of many unconverted church members and then it spreads out into the general society. And, and it's usually all included in the name revival. But it is a spiritual awakening. And we pray for both on a daily basis. We want to see the effects of revival spread out into our society. And we have historical, I think, as well as biblical reasons to pray for this. And then finally, revivalism. This refers to the application and use of certain methods or measures 
that are used to produce religious excitement and promote religious decisions. Revivalism, however, is not revival. It's something that can be worked up. And even uh, in our day, it's common among some of the old Baptists uh, to talk about scheduling a revival meeting. And even some of my Calvinistic brethren have picked up this Arminian language. Oh, I preached a revival meeting at so-and-so. Well, really, did they have a revival? Well, no. But it was a revival meeting. No, it was revivalism. And they failed to see the difference between the two. I've read all the works, the three major works of Finney, evaluated his work, and in my book, The History of Revival and Spiritual Awakening, I, I've dealt with an analysis of Finney's work, his Pelagian philosophy, uh, his idea of the free will of man, uh, his application of what was called the new measures, and so forth. And he forever tainted American Christianity, even among, sadly, some of my Calvinistic brethren. Uh, who confuse revival and revivalism. But revivalism is not revival. Revival is an outpouring of the Spirit of God in power and cleansing, which brings great divine blessings. It cannot be worked up, must bus be prayed down. Now I want to give my personal experience. Some of you are going to think this is rather mundane and of little consequence. There was a tract to given out in 1947 or 48 in Joe's Joint in Lompoc, California. It was given to my father who was playing pool at the back of the bar by a Salvation Army worker. She walked in, little gray-haired lady, looked around, picked out the roughest looking man and handed him a tract. Where will you spend eternity? He put it behind his pack of Lucky Strike cigarettes, continued playing pool. It led to his salvation. That tract is still bearing fruit today. We were talking about Mark Bala. He's fruit of that tract, converted to Cal Poly during the revival that took place in 1977 and 78 when 150 Cal Poly college students were converted there. My dad, was a soul winner, very evangelistic, Arminian Bible teacher for 25 years. He finally came to the doctrines of grace through reading The Sovereignty of God by Arthur Pink. His old Sunday school teacher, an old lady, gave him that book so he could see how awful it was. And he said, I'm going, he loved Arthur Pink, taught through several of his commentaries. I'm going to see at what point he goes astray. About page 35, he was a Calvinist. He was ordained at age 57, began to pastor a house church, he held church in his home. He had two radio programs that he's paid for, a dollar a minute, once a week. He preached in Santa Barbara County. One was local and one went up to San Luis Obispo. And he was preaching through the book of Romans. He received a phone call and uh, was a young man. He took it to be the father of the family. And he said, Mr. Downing, he said, you're a Calvinist. He said, there are some of us who have joined with the Founders Group in the Southern Baptist Convention. We love the doctrines of grace. He said, well, he said, we'd like to come down and visit you. He said, well, I hold church in my home. Here's my address. And he said, you drink coffee? Yes, so I'll put on a pot of coffee. He said, you eat chili beans? I'll put on a, a, my dad's favorite chili beans. My wife said, you're the only man I know who brags, bragged about his dad's cooking. And he made great chili beans. I'll put on a pot of beans. Well, who pulled up in the driveway that Sunday morning with three carloads of college students? My dad says, it's not right for you to come down here he said, I should go up there. So he began to teach weekly in a frat house 
on the campus of Cal Poly, well, near to the campus of Cal Poly. God began to do a work. We arranged to have some meetings. He called me on the phone. He said, Ron Edmonds is coming up from Los Angeles. He was the first Reformed Baptist on the West Coast, Englishman, dear brother, close friend, passed away at age 83 of pancreatic cancer. His church is now the uh, Trinity Reformed Baptist Church of La Mirada. At any rate, he came up, Ed Bryant came up, and I came down. And I think there was, a, there was another man there who was a student at the time, and his son is now our song leader. Years and years later, 40-some years later. And he was just graduated from Cal Poly, and right down the street from Firestone Grill, he started a church in that Seventh-day Adventist building. I used to go down there and preach for him. Dennis Muster. And so we went down. I took a Greyhound bus down there because my wife needed the station wagon for carpool. And we had about four nights of meetings. Can you imagine college students, maybe up to 250 of them in a large auditorium sitting under the preaching of three or four men. One night I preached an hour and 15 minutes. I said, keep on preaching. What preaching there was. What an atmosphere there was. The revival had begun. Three churches were formed out of that meeting. One in Santa Maria under Ed Bryant that lasted for many years. And... Uh, one in San Luis, then my father's church profited from the revival in Lompoc. But the revival began. It lasted for two years. There were at least 150 students saved. Some of them are in the ministry today. Some are on the mission field. Some are still in my church. Years later, uh, Cheryl, good friend, been there. Uh, one of my deacons, Chris. Chris and, and uh, Mark met at Cal Poly during that revival. Both ended up moving into the Bay Area and becoming members of our church. Jerry Peace, who's retired now and used to be the gardener for a uh, well-known musician. Can't think of his name either internationally known. I used to hunt hogs and keep his uh, gardens and landscaping cleaned up for him there. But uh, we probably had 25 or 30 students come to our church. Some of them went south to the other churches in Southern California. Some of them went to seminary. Some of them went back east and joined with the churches there. For two years, that revival continued. God did a great work. And some of those people, at least most of them, are still serving God today. And it's one of those collegiate revivals that is lost in history. Nobody knows much about it. I guess I should write a book on it. If I were good for names and remember them, I would. That is the only time of revival that my father's father saw during his ministry. He died in 1982 at age 65 but he saw and experienced revival. Then in 1994, we established our present church, not under the best of circumstances, and the people were rubbed pretty raw. Things like that happen in a church split. I don't want to go into that. It's in the past by, what, 27, 28 years now. And uh, we met uh, in an Assemblies of God church. They gave us a room to meet in. And the first day that we met, I, I didn't know, so I'll have to tell you a little bit about this. I resigned and left after 20 years as pastor. I resigned and left. We were alone. Three rather 
unfaithful family said, we're not going back. And I says, well, let's meet at my house on Sunday and I'll bring a short Bible study. And they all left within a few weeks anyway. But I guess they were looking for some adventure religiously, I'm not sure. And then I received a phone call the next morning from one of the men who said, Pastor, we have a problem. And I dropped the phone, a landline, and I shook. I was going through a mental breakdown. I had gone to the doctor, and he took my blood pressure. It was 150 over 100. And I was 54 at the time. wonder I didn't have a stroke then. And he said, I said, what, what more can they do? He said, no, the problem is we can't get everybody in your church. We had enough room to put about 25, 30 people in there. So he said, I'll find a place to meet. We met with 40, I think 49 people, started the church with 20 members that day. And uh, then we met at the YMCA in Milpitas. And uh, we were a small group, and we continued as a small group for about a year, 1994, 1995. And then we held some, we had two prayer meetings a week. One prayer meeting for the men and another prayer meeting for the women. That had never happened before. And my, there, there were good attendants. The, the men would stay home and babysit the children. We had a lot of families with small children. And uh, so the women had their night out. And we even had bed bugs there in Spring Valley Bible Church because he allowed some of the homeless people to stay in there. So we scratched and slapped and, and itched and had our prayer meetings. But uh, at any rate, but, but God began to work. And uh, it was in 1995 through the spring of 2000, we grew to over 200 people. We had baptisms about every week. You tried to walk through the baptistry in, in, uh, in uh, that backyard. Micah. Oh, Micah did. Yeah, there was just a bubble deal over the top, and he decided to run across it and sunk. That was an unanticipated baptism. But at any rate, we would have five to seven people for a baptism every month. People would come in off the street and be converted. There was such an atmosphere that I could leave my Bible and my notes on the pulpit and I could walk up and down the aisle and preach and never miss a lick. There was such an atmosphere there, if I'd have been charismatic, I'd have tried to fly. I've never experienced anything like this in my life and it lasted for five years. Then we got our present building in Morgan Hill, Be beautiful building really, and bought it from a Pentecostal church and uh, the day we moved into that building, which was, I think, April 10th, uh, 2000, the church was, what, six years old at that time. There was a change. God took his hand off that work. The, 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 the division started, the uh, worldliness, just everything, and I could sense it that day. I remember one of the visitors said, Bill, this church is too good for you. This building and everything is too good for you. You don't deserve it. I said, I know. But people were now sitting in comfortable pews and not on, on uh, folding chairs. The prayer meeting dwindled down to one prayer on a Wednesday night. And we lost about 40 or 50 people when we moved down there because they were coming from 50, 60 miles in the other direction. People would drive an hour and a half or more to come to church during those glorious years, and then it was over. And uh, we've had some blessing of God since then, but uh, these two times are the best times in my life when I think at least I tasted of true revival. And it's something that it's like anything I've ever experienced, and it was glorious. It was blessed. I thought it would continue. Revival never does. And uh, in, in my list of books, there, there's one called One Divine Moment, the Asbury College Revival of 1970. 
and the man evaluated the, uh, the revival that took place, took place in a student prayer meeting. It affected 130 Bible colleges across the United States and theological seminaries. But it came and it left. He said there are two types of revival. One is more emotional based. It's a true work of God. People are converted. Lives are changed. But it quickly dissipates. Other revivals that are more doctrinal in substance may last for several years or longer. And most of the revivals in our nation in recent history have been sort of a flash in the pan. They've been the real works of God. They've lasted maybe for a year or two, and then they're over, they're gone. So uh, I've studied everything I can on revival. I've probably read 150 books or more on revival. I've studied it. I've digested it. I've talked to people who have experienced revival. Uh, Brother Rye's been in my home several times. He and his wife were there for dinner. We spent the afternoon and evening together and so forth. And what you said was true. You went over there with these other men and you observed revival. And they were experiencing revival. You were observing it. It's hard to explain, but there was an element of life. And, and you partook of it when you were there. It's just... Uh, and all of the ingredients that went into that. Dr. Rye being a communist general. That has much to do with that. And the freedom he has to preach there. His conversion. Crawling to the home of a Christian and being converted. And shot and left for dead on the battlefield. And his reputation as the general still helps him today for people to leave his ministry alone. This strange things. No two revivals are alike. But we should pray for revival and spiritual awakening. We need it in this nation desperately because what we have here religiously, I am convinced, is revivalism. And it's all going in the wrong way. But I want to deal with our national history. And I'm basing my outline here on the book by uh, Richard Cole Sr., The Mighty Acts of God in America. And he has detailed in his book, which is easy to read. He has great quotations. Uh, Revival Literature Crusade in North Carolina uh, publishes that book. And I asked for several copies, and he shipped me a whole case of them. So you might get some free copies out of it. And uh, one of the right-hand men there is... His name begins with an L. He spends six months of every year in Egypt. He has a theological seminary over there, and he has, he's the head of Georgia Baptist College. Name begins with an L. He studied under Dr. Conley when he was in Texas. He got the vision under Dr. Conley. We both studied under the same man who gave us both a vision for revival and prayer. Greatest man of prayer I ever knew. And he's been in our church and preached for us years ago. And uh, Lascelius, Robert Lascelius, you may know him, Robert Lascelius. And uh, really a great man. But at any rate, there have been several, seven spiritual awakenings in our national history. Beginning in 1734, before we were a nation, and extending to 1905. So the first was the first great awakening from 1734 to 1750 under Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Gilbert Tennant, and his relatives, and a few others. The great awakening, uh, and it began under the ministry of Jonathan Edwards. Have you read about Jonathan Edwards being thrown out of his church? He had a problem with a deacon and uh, it was either immorality or a divorce or something in the church. And that deacon had been laying for him for years and years. And uh, they finally put him out of the church. That was after the Great Awakening when he was considered the greatest preacher in the Western world. They got rid of him. He went up to Stockbridge, Massachusetts on the frontier, did all of his writing. Thank God for that. And, and was uh, a mentor to uh, David Brainerd. 
missionary to the Indians. There were several great missionaries at that time. David Brainerd's probably the most well known. But he began to preach, and his preaching is not light. If you've read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, it's very logical. And he read his sermon. People would hang on the pews and hang on the pillars of the church, crying out for mercy. Just the power of God was upon his preaching. He didn't tell stories. He didn't rouse the people emotionally or so. But, boy, the words came with the power of God. And then Whitfield came. And uh, if you read the writings of Lloyd-Jones, he speaks about the meeting between Whitfield. Whitfield is invited to the, to the church of Jonathan Edwards. And Whitfield is preaching in the pulpit, totally unlike Edwards. And Edwards is sitting there just weeping, and the tears are falling down on his shirt and on his pant leg. And he's just dissolved in tears, listening to this, this powerful note of preaching. God did mighty things. And Whitfield went throughout all the 13 colonies. Just as an aside, nine of the original 13 colonies had state churches, and they horribly persecuted the Baptists. They imprisoned and beat the Baptist preachers. They closed down their churches. They, 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 they sent men in to get on these outdoor meetings that they had to get the preacher out of the pulp and beat him to a pulp. Many of those men were converted. And we're talking about Presbyterians, Anglicans, and Congregationalists who were sent in to stop these meetings. Interesting. Well, this was a, an awakening. It was not only a revival within the church, it spread throughout the community. In the first year, there were 300 people in, uh, in that town who were converted. Before then, they had all sorts of social problems. Now, religion was the subject everyone talked about, and it had lasting effects. The next was the Second Great Awakening from 1790 to 1814. This was the beginning of the frontier revivals and emotional extremes. Finney will come in 1824. This is before the time of Finney. Uh, this was real beginnings of Pentecostalism in these frontier meetings. Uh, people would bark like dogs and jump around, and they had all this emotional uh, extreme and so forth. Finney unified all of these extremes into a system and added his Pelagian uh, anthropology to it. And so he came in just with a full head of sail in 1824 and beyond. But there were extremes, and yet God did a work. And uh, they began to give altar calls. And, of course, they were outdoor meetings. They were camp meetings. People would come in covered wagons and so, and they would camp out for uh, a week at a time, maybe longer, and they would rope off a place. And if you wanted to be prayed for or make your decision or whatever, you went into that rope area. The Methodists did. The Baptists were more Calvinistic in those days. In fact, all the Baptists, do you know how many free will Baptist churches there were in 1780 in America? Free will Baptist churches? Six. Benjamin Randall and the, and the free will Baptists. Everybody else was solid Calvinists. The regular Baptists were all Calvinistic. And they supported these revivals. And God did a great work. Then again, the Third Awakening came from 1815 to 1829. Charles Finney arrives on the scene, and the great shift in evangelical American religion and revival turned to revivalism through his influence. True revival was still here, and true revivals would still take place, but revivalism came in and... Uh, took away the unity and caused a lot of uh, ungodly competition. Finney was a lawyer. Most of our brethren don't believe he was ever converted. On basic biblical doctrine, he was as defective as could be. 
he has in his autobiography a whole chapter on his I'm getting the attention of Brother Dalcor, his experience of justification, which he confused with his idea of sanctification. And under perfectionist teaching, which came from the Wesleys, your salvation depends on your sanctification. Lose your sanctification, you lose your justification. All of this is coming in with Finney. Finney was a lawyer. He looked at himself as a lawyer through human argument and reasoning could convince the masses of people who heard him and he looked upon them as the jury he had to convince. His old pastor's name was Gale, G-A-L-E, and uh, he more or less converted him to his views. Gale failed in not espousing revivalism according to, uh, according to Finney, but uh, Finney, Wherever Finney went in preaching and so forth, he caused divisions in the churches and so forth. Uh, his ministry was a flash in the pan. He got a lot of religious decisions. But he was a Pelagian uh, in his philosophy theology. And Pelagian, Pelagius uh, was early 5th century, late 4th century, early 5th century. Where did he get his name, Pelagius? It's a Greek to Latin name. He was from England, Britain. Britain was at the edge of the world over the deep sea. Pelagic sharks, deep sea fishes, Pelagic. So he was the man from the deep sea. His name was Pelagius. He took that. He went to Rome and he taught that through mere human effort, we could become sinlessly perfect. He preached his perfectionist doctrine. In order to do that, he had to teach that man had a free will. And some of my old uh, fellowship brethren, still Arminians and so forth, they said, well, the nature of man is like the walls of Jericho. When man fell, everything fell down except that one part of the wall where Rahab's house was, that's man's free will. He still has a free will. If man doesn't have a free will, how can we offer him the gospel if he doesn't make his decision? And uh, couldn't convince them out of that. But uh, we know it's not decision, it's conversion. Now think about this. The real issue is regeneration or the new birth. And the New Testament uses 15 different metaphors for regeneration or the new birth. But how do we know we're regenerated? By our conversion experience. Because conversion is the experience not regeneration. Finney made regeneration the experience and he made it the answer of God and response of God to man's decision. And there are many today in so-called evangelical Christianity who have that method, that regeneration of the new birth is a response to man's faith. And I got this out of an outstanding seminary which one I don't remember, so I won't mention the name. Uh, but it, it's a large seminary. Once man exercises that faith that the Bible states is saving faith, he is regenerated. That's self-salvation. That's being saved by your own faith, which has to be mere human trust. If God only responds to that and you're spiritually born again into God's kingdom. A whole reversal of that. So we have inherited in American evangelical Christianity and charismatic Christianity and so forth, we've inherited a very corrupt doctrine of soteriology. And many people do not realize it. They want people to make a decision. They don't talk about conversion. I made my decision on a Sunday night. I was 10 years old. At age 20, I went through an entire year of horrible depression. I put a revolver to my head once and pulled back the hammer. It was a model, uh, I think, a 564 Smith & Wesson uh, 38 Special, pound and a half pressure, not been in eternity. 
I'm 20 years old and life has no meaning. I'm 20 years old and I intend to be a commercial deep sea diver. I have thousands of dollars of equipment and I'm, I'm in construction work to buy a diving boat. Abalone business was big then. And they're going to be a commercial diver, eventually get into the oil uh, uh, derricks off the coast and so forth and make the big time money. That's it. I was the carnal Christian. So occasionally I'd rededicate my life. And then about the end of this time of conviction of sin, I came to a horrible conclusion. I was fighting against God. Not my dad who had been praying for me. Dad stopped praying for me. He said, if you will leave what you're doing now and go to Biola, I will pay your way four years. My dad spent a year at Biola in 1952. <clears throat> had to come home. My mother had a mental breakdown, one of many. And uh, here I am. Dad, probably the roughest thing I ever said to my dad, don't try to live your life in mine. He, he was broken hard to praying for me. Of course, I was just a carnal Christian. So I went forward, October 1961, on a Sunday night, Bible Baptist Church in Lompoc, which is now conservative Baptist or something else. And uh, I'd been attending there for about a year, which explains the conviction of sin. I finally came down. This is a conviction of sin. I went forward and... Bill Finch was the pastor, and he said, Bill, why are you coming? I said, to move my membership to this church from the old modernistic church where I grew up and to rededicate my life. People began to cry. They needed a young people's director for the high school, college age class. They needed a Sunday school teacher. The next week, I was teaching there Arthur Pink, Gleanings in Genesis. Got on the right track. But at any rate, uh, they've been praying for, they needed a song leader, and I had a very loud voice. In those days, I could carry a tune. And so they, God was at work. They thought revival was taking place. I helped put away the folding chairs we met in a, in a hall, rented hall. Went outside, the fog's rolling in off the ocean. And I said, all right, God, now you can get off my back. I've done everything I can. And it was worse. Man, I was just getting my face ground into the gravel. I went home. I was living alone at the time. My folks had moved to Cal uh, Northern California to live on my uncle's ranch. And uh, I checked into the dispatch shack. I was to go to work 7 o'clock the next morning or 7.30. We were pouring a missile silo at Vandenberg. And here I am, prostrate on a cold linoleum floor beside my bed, unable to sleep in a cold sweat, and I was there most of the night. And I said, look, I can, I, this is it. I, can, I can't go on. It has to be settled now. It has to be settled tonight. And uh, I'm telling you this, you can believe it or not, I really don't care. This is what I experienced. I said, look, I've tried to live the Christian life, and I can't do it. If you're going to kill me, just do it now and get it over with. Uh, my gun was locked up and safe. And I'd come to the end of my rope, but I'd finally found this was conviction of sin. God was dealing with me. And I lay on that floor for a long time. It's about, what, two, maybe three in the morning. And I finally got up. And I'm just covered with sweat. And I said, okay, Lord, if you're not going to kill me, then from here on out, I will live for you. Complete surrender. That's conversion. I got up the next morning and went to work. And the, and the, the, the foreman, that was a wicked place. My dad used to be a, a foreman there. He, he ran the batch plant, mixed concrete. And he had left. They wanted him to cheat on the job, and he, he left the company. I walked in, and the foreman was sitting there, and he, he looked up and saw me walk in slammed his chair against the wall, and he said, what happened to you? Did you get up last night? And I said, no. Before the day was over, all 20 drivers in that company knew that Bill had religion. I got behind a concrete mixer, and I said, God has done something to me. That's salvation. I was taught it's what you did. And uh, that was my conversion. <clears throat> 
Two years later, I went to Bible college. And during those two years, uh, God, God did some, some great and mighty things in my life. And my dad came back to town. We became the closest of friends. We were that way until he died in the hospital early one morning. Miner's lung, diatomaceous earth, white lung. I, I still, I had, they lost all the CDs when I wrecked my truck. I hear him on the radio and say a few words. And he was like that from age 22 until age 65. And God kept him alive. And he was a wicked man. God saved him. And I mean, it was from night to day, from black to white, from darkness to light. And personal revival. But at any rate, I got really sidetracked. So we have Charles Finney revivalism. And then we have the fourth great awakening. So these are not only revivals in the churches. All of these changed society. They had an effect upon society. And God preserved our nation through its early years and decades. By this means, we have the, from 1830-1834, the fourth great awakening, and then the great prayer revival, 1857 through 1859. You've heard about the Dutch Reformed Church on Fulton Street in New York, Jeremiah Calvin Lamphere, who was used. That revival started in Hamilton, Ontario, about a year or two before. There were several hundred pre I preached in that town in uh, 1982 in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, Al Martin preached one week, and I preached the next week up there in an old, old Baptist church. But revival began in Hamilton, Ontario, just a small town. It filtered down into the United States. They just went through the fall of Wall Street, a great financial collapse, which we may have here in this next year or so, but a great financial collapse. In the Fulton uh, Street Old Dutch Church, they, they called a city missionary. He's 44 years of age. His name was... Uh, Jeremiah Calvin Lamphere. He was, a, he was a, a bachelor, 44 years of age, and they said, we give you the slums of New York as your mission field. And he was overpowered. What in the world am I going to do? I can't reach thousands and thousands of people like this. He was overpowered by it. He prayed. He was impressed to start a noontime prayer meeting. He advertised it in the upper room of that old church on Fulton Avenue. Six people came toward the end of the half an hour. They prayed and left. Not going well. He kept it up. He kept it up. Within about two months, the whole church could not hold the people that came, mostly businessmen, and within about four months, Wall Street was on its knees. Thousands of businessmen praying. That revival went clear across to California. 1857, 1858. Then it went across the sea to Northern Ireland. Became the great uh, Northern Ireland 1859 awakening. Uh, the Haldane brothers were involved in that. Robert Haldane wrote the commentary on Romans. He went to Geneva, was ready to give up. He'd already booked passage uh, to go to Berlin or someplace uh, when several young men came to him. The great outstanding, would become the great outstanding evangelical leaders of Europe. Uh, Louis Gausson, wrote uh, The Inspiration of Scripture. Uh, Merle Daubigny, head of the French Free Reformed Churches and so forth. These six men were in that Bible study when he went through the Book of Romans. Revival came throughout all of Europe at that time. It, it went from uh, to, to Scotland. Uh, Andrew Bonner and uh, the Bonner brothers were affected by that. It went from there to Wales and finally into England. And uh, I'm trying to think of the... Uh, of the great Scottish evangelist who was used during that time and 
I don't have it written down. Do I have it written down? Uh, McShane was there, and uh, one of his, uh, there were four or five men that were used throughout Scotland and so forth. The one man, I don't know, he was a, a fiery preacher, and uh, he was just a profligate, a, a, a reprobate. And when he would come into town, he was a wealthy man. His father, his uncle owned a great large estate, and he, he hunted all the time. That got my attention. But he was playing cards one night. He was 40-some years of age with his sons. He had a stroke or something. He just sat back in his chair. I, I, I can't think of uh, the man's name. But whole books have been written about him. No, that he was in 1950, 52, 49 to 52. Uh, he, uh, he said, take me to my room. I'm a dead man. They laid him out in the bed, thought he was dying. Two hours later, he came out of that bedroom, a believer. And he set Scotland on fire. And he was mightily used of God in that 1859 awakening. Spurgeon had a revival at the tabernacle about 1852, 53, 54, 55, unrelated to any revival any place else in Britain. And then he partook again of the 1859 revival. Then we come to the great revival. I'll be a Christian tonight and talk about the war between the states. I won't name it the war of northern aggression. That makes me a racist, I understand. But uh, has anyone here ever read W.W. Bennett, the great revival among the southern armies? And he was a Methodist chaplain. That is an awesome book. Get it and read it. Finney's methods got lost at the beginning months of that revival. Most of the Southern officers were preachers. They had revival that could not quit. They figure over 300,000 men, considered Union and Confederate, were converted during that time. Over 150,000 in the Southern armies. Great prayer meetings. And uh, who's the great theologian that came out of that uh, revival? Presbyterian, Southern Presbyterian. Dabney, R.L. Dabney, chief of staff for Stonewall Jackson. I have his picture on my wall. Don't, I, I'm a Baptist, but I have a lot of Presbyterians, John Calvin, and a lot of Presbyterian missionaries, all their portraits along the wall in the second story of our church building. We don't worship men, but we do acknowledge great men of God in history. God did a tremendous work at one of the worst times in history, and especially of our national history. Has anyone read the story of the great Re London revival during the plague year of 1665? What happened in 1662 in England, in, 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 in Britain, England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland? What happened in 1662? The great ejection. Puritans were all put out of their pulpit. It was a horrible time. It was an awful time. Many were in prison. The Five Mile Act, they couldn't come within five miles of a town. The plague hit London in 1665, three years later. All of the established clergy fled London. Get out into the country. Stay away from crowds. All the Puritans came back into London. Hundreds of thousands of people were converted. They were back in the pulpits again preaching the gospel and nobody bothered them. I don't know what the plague was, but you could be healthy at 8 o'clock in the morning and dead before dark. And people were in fear of death. I mean, there were coffins all over the street, bodies and so forth. They packed the churches and God sent a great revival. In the very worst of times, and we may be headed for this as a nation, in the very worst of times, God has sent some of his greatest revivals. It's not the work of man. It's not through fear. It's a work of the Spirit of God when he brings men to terms with themselves and holds the truth before them. Now we come to uh, the final spiritual awakening. There were periodic revivals under D.L. Moody and uh, others uh, till the end of the century. Uh, Billy Sunday and so forth, they, uh, 
Moody was not that much of a sensationalist. Billy Sunday was a sensationalist. My grandmother was an immigrant from Germany, settling in Colorado Springs, and she was born in 1882, came over here in 1886, and then uh, married my grandfather in 1903, 19, 1913. In, in their correspondence, I, I came up with some of their correspondence years ago, they talked about the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. But at any rate, uh, my, my grandmother, Mary Stoll, as a, as a young girl, went to a Billy Sunday meeting with her family. The family was basically Catholic, but hundreds of people were there. Billy Sunday got up and he said, I want every woman under this big tent to cross your legs. When they did that, he said, the gates of hell are now closed, and he began to preach. He was offensive. He was a sensationalist. That's, that's rough even for old men, isn't it? But and they got up and walked out, by the way. They, they found they were German people and at least dignified. But uh, yeah, really, really something. This is not in my notes, of course. <laughs> but uh, but there, there were per periodic revivals, localized revivals, uh, maybe in a city or a town or a state or an area and so forth. No great national revivals until 1905. The effect of the Welsh revival was the seventh and last great spiritual awakening in the United States. What, 116 years ago about now? Something like that. And the Welsh revival, the effects of it came to America. The reports of it came to America. People began to pray. It had an effect upon society, which had not occurred since the war between the states. This was, it, it had a, a deciding effect. I didn't know that until I read and studied about it. Uh, I had not seen the importance of that revival. I do know that the Welsh revival went clear around the globe in a little over a decade. That's the Korean Pentecost was a result of the Welsh revival. They began, countries around the world began to pray for revival. Christians, and, and they began to experience revival and what we would call spiritual awakenings. And there have been many localized revivals since that time. I never thought I would go over time, and I have. Uh, there have been localized revivals. The, the Asbury College Revival, that's a Methodist college, began in a student prayer meeting. And it shook that place, and eventually, eventually it spread to 130 Bible colleges and seminaries across the United States. And the book is called One Divine Moment. And it, it dissipated within a couple of years, but the work was done, and it was a real time of revival. We've had revival on college campuses as late as 1995. They were over in a few weeks. But many people were truly converted, and the work of God was done. And we have the greatest encouragement, uh, I think, from the Word of God and from history to pray not only for revival in our churches, but a, a spiritual awakening. Who knows what the Lord will do in our country? How far will he take America down before God's people really began to pray? And we wonder about it, we talk about it in our church uh, when the men get together and so forth, and I talk about it with some of the families. Will we have to be persecuted here? Which we may. It could easily come. Government control, socialism. But if people began to pray, God may, in this generation, bring not only revival to our churches, but a time of spiritual awakening to our society. We pray for it daily. And with that, I'll close. Hopefully I've given you much to think about and challenged you to read and refresh your soul on the matter of revival and spiritual awakening. Thank you.